I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. Of all the bugs in our garden, only 3% are considered pest. Now they're the ones that actually do some damage to our plants, but the other 97%, well they're either beneficial or neutral, meaning they don't do any harm. So why then are we so quick to reach for those pesticides to treat such a minute problem? That's the same question posed by one person that was so determined to show the horticultural industry better ways to deal with pests, she's dedicated her professional life to taking on the problem, one bug at a time. Suzanne Wainwright Evans is an industry veteran of over 18 years with degrees in entomology and environmental horticulture. But it's her unique skills as an ornamental entomologist specializing in integrated pest management that keeps her in high demand within the green industry. She's the owner of Bug Lady Consulting and when she's not looking for insects in a greenhouse or nursery, chances are she's working in her own backyard garden looking to solve the next great pest problem. I've been working with insects so for a long time and one of the questions I get most often is where do insects come from? And they can come from lots of places. The wind, right now, insects can blow in on the wind and a lot of them float. Aphids, spider mites, thrips, wind currents can carry them right into your garden. Another way that they can find your plants is they actually look for them through visual cues by looking at the plants and recognizing them. They may land on your plant and take a taste and if it's the right plant, they'll stay and feed, but if it's not their food source, then they'll just keep moving on until they find the right plant. Also, you can actually buy in your insect problems. It's very important to thoroughly inspect your plants when you buy them to bring them home to make sure there are no hitchhikers on the undersides of the leaves or even in the roots. How do you know if it's a good bug or a bad bug? What I always do is I stop and I take a look. If I see a lot of insects hanging out together, usually they're not up to a lot of good. Um, a lot of the plant feeders hang out together because they're not going to eat each other. Insects that are meat eaters usually don't hang out together because they want to eat meat. Also, just watch. And if you watch them, like a caterpillar, you can actually watch them chew and do feeding damage where something like a ladybug is going to be crawling along, searching and looking for food for it to eat. Working with homeowners and commercial growers, one of the things I always tell them is if you want to have an insect problem, start spraying. Typically, once you start spraying with something like a synthetic pesticide, the first thing you do is knock out the beneficial insects that may be there controlling your pest problems to begin with. And then the pests can get out of control their numbers. Once you identify your pest problem, you want to select a product that is targeted for your specific issue. The products today available on the market are a lot smarter, but better yet, why not use one of the biocontrol agent products? One example would be if you have a grub problem in your grass and using the beneficial nematodes. You don't need to treat your whole lawn, you can just target treat that one specific area. And one of the great things about the biocontrol agents today is that they're actually commercially produced in what they call insectaries. These are laboratories that produce those insects and it is federally regulated. So if you buy something, it's not like you're going to let an invasive species out. It is controlled by the government so you can feel safe in what you buy that you're not going to cause any problems. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're an experienced gardener or just starting out, there's some basic things that you can do to have an eco-friendly garden and minimize your pest impact as well. The first thing you always want to do is plant right plant in right place. Read the plant tags, do your research. If it says plant it in the sun, plant it in the sun. Sun plants don't belong in the shade. 
Absolutely, a plant in distress is very attractive to a lot of types of pests. Yes, it is, and also plants that are fertilized too much, those can be attractive to pest insects also. So make sure you read the label on your fertilizers and do not over apply. And you can also bring in types of plants that are very attractive to beneficials to draw them into your garden. Correct. A lot of plants with small flowers such as alyssum and dill and basil is another really good one. When basil goes to bloom, those beneficial insects really love those tiny blooms. What about irrigation? Also, too much water. Too much water can cause disease problems in plants, and once you get disease, it can invite insect pests in. And there's a lot of different beneficial insects that you can bring into your garden, whether you're attracting them with plants or you're actually purchasing them for your garden. Correct. You can buy predatory mites, you can buy beneficial wasps, and even today you can buy bumblebees. People are very concerned about pollination and the loss of honeybees, so bumblebees are a replacement that you can put out in your garden, and it will pollinate your plants for you. And they have them available now in homeowner-sized hives. Bumblebees to go. Very clever. So it's one thing to talk about the good that beneficial insects and other organisms do in the garden. It's another thing to see them in action. And it's a good thing that we have Bug Lady here for that because you come into her kitchen and right next to her coffee maker and her juicer, she's got this high-powered microscope and some other things. So tell us about some of those un unsung heroes in the garden and some of the benefits that they do. Right. One of the unsung heroes in the garden is actually called a flower fly. Um, they resemble bees, um, so often people do think they are bees, but they actually have a very unique flight pattern that fly kind of and hover over the flowers. The adults feed on pollen, it's the larval stage that you really want. And that's that immature stage, they almost look like worms, right? Correct, they look like tiny little worms and they will live on the underside of leaves and they will crawl along and they look for soft bodied insects to feed on, things like aphids and uh, caterpillars. And you have a video of that that you actually took Correct. of this happening. These were right from my garden and here you have the flower fly larva feeding right on the aphid and it's actually using its mouth parts to suck out the inside of the aphid. They don't consume the whole aphid but they eat the inside out and then they leave the dead carcass behind and will move along to the next victim it's going to feed on. Amazing. Talk about the lady beetle. That seems to be the most common one out there. Uh, the adult is very popular and people actually will purchase them but there's even a more effective form of their stage that's good for the garden. Right. The larval stage of ladybugs are very aggressive predators. Most people um, have seen them but don't know what they are. Um, this is actually a, a container of the larva of a two-spot uh, ladybird beetle, uh, which is uh, native to the United States. and. As you can see, they will climb around and look for anything to feed on. They'll feed on spider mites, they'll feed on aphids, they'll even feed on each other if they find each other. So I can order these and they're shipped and I just take them out and put them in my garden and Correct. they go to work. And you want to make sure that you order larvae that are laboratory reared not adults because the adults are wild harvested out of the Sierra Nevadas mm. and they're scooped up and put in refrigerators and then held until people order them. The problem with that is is that since they've been hibernating they're not that aggressive of feeders. Also when you release them they tend to fly away and also uh, research has shown us that uh, they do carry parasites and diseases that are not harmful to people or animals but can go after ladybugs that you have in your own garden. So it's best to get uh, laboratory reared ones. And these guys at this stage don't have wings so they're not going anywhere. Nope and you can just take a paintbrush and put them out on your plants. It's a great project to put out with your children. What about microscopic nematodes, those little tiny worms that are all over your soil? They are also effective in dealing with certain things like the iris problem that everybody seems to have with the borer. The iris borer is a pretty common pest found um, in a lot of gardens where uh, people grow iris. It actually lives underground in the iris root and this is actually a piece of iris root and it is actually eaten out the hole inside of it. Hmm. It's actually a caterpillar that will turn into a moth. Um, since they live inside the root and feed on the inside of the root, traditional pesticides don't work so well to treat for them. So what's best to use are the beneficial nematodes because they're absolutely safe for people and your pets and the nematodes will actually go into the root, find the iris borer, infect it and kill it. And how, it's a completely organic way. How do they find them? 
Uh, the nematodes can actually sense carbon dioxide emissions, which will be coming off the insect. Huh. You can also sense movement. Even when you've done all you can to cut down on those existing pest populations, you never know when they're going to show up in your garden or how they even get there in the first place. But there's one thing you can do to cut down on those uninvited pests from showing up in the first place, and for you and me, that starts right here at the nursery or garden center. Ugh. Restraint, Joe. Restraint is so hard. With all these fragrances and colors, how could you not want to hang out here all day? And you can't blame the bugs for wanting to do the same thing. Unfortunately, some of these are the bad guys and you don't want those going home. So here's what I do whenever I'm in a nursery and I'm buying these plants. Like this, for example. This is lantana. It's hardy throughout much of the south and it doesn't matter if it's lantana or anything else. You want to run your hands over the top of it. What you're looking for here is to see if any bugs are flying away. A lot of times that would be whitefly and you don't want those coming home. This right now looks really clean. I don't see anything flying around other than some great butterflies, but so far so good. Now once I'm satisfied with that, the next thing I want to do is look at these leaves. You especially want to check out underneath for any residue or biting or stippling, you know that debris that's left behind by insects. You also want to check for discoloration in the leaves. That could be a sign of pest problems as well. This doesn't have any of that. It's really clean. I'm really happy with this plant, so this is going home with me. Oh, and there's one other thing that I want to look at when I'm in a nursery. This happens to be aster. Now, it's okay if you're careful. Nurseries know if you know your plants, a lot of times people will do this. You want to pull it out of the pot. And what you're looking for here is root damage because sometimes there's insects that lurk down in here. It can cause some damage. It'll show up in discoloration or the roots just won't look right. But these look great. They're white. They look really healthy. I'm happy with this plant. So, looks like I've got a great stash here. Probably out of money, so I better check out now. All right, I've inspected my plants at the nursery and I believe them to be pest free, but there's something I always do when I get home and that's to blast my plants with water. That's gonna knock off any lurking pests and that's especially important with your house plants. Now, as much as I've done, pest control really starts behind the scenes. It happens here at the commercial grower or nursery. In a place like this, there are literally thousands of plants that are all the same. So it's heaven on earth to invading pests that see this as an endless supply of their favorite food. So naturally, growers have their work cut out for them on how to deal with such a potential problem. The traditional way has been with conventional pesticides. But with an ever-growing interest by so many to avoid these approaches, biological pest control methods are becoming more popular than ever, which is why Suzanne stays so busy consulting with her clients. All right, so this concept of biological control, it might sound a little difficult to get your arms around, but it's not. It's simply the use of beneficial insects and organisms to manage your pest naturally. Even in a wholesale operation, Rich, as a grower, you use these all the time, like this is aureus, this is a true bug, right? Correct. Now, where do you get these and how do you use them? Like all of these black pearl peppers here, you don't grow these, but these are here to aid in the pest control problem. Right, we get the all the beneficial insects from commercial insectaries mm -hmm. and we buy them in. I release them onto the, p the pepper plants here. These pepper plants serve as a source of food for the aureus when there's no pest insects in the area. So even when the pest insects are gone, they have a source of food, it keeps the beneficials here. And that's really important because if you didn't have that alternate food source, those beneficial insects would fly off to wherever they need to go to get their next meal, but by having these here, they stick around. Correct. So you actually want a few pests around just to make sure that the beneficials stay. Yes, it's not a bad thing to have one or two pest bugs here because they just, in turn, are food for the beneficials. You also have uh, these little trays of grass growing that I see scattered throughout your trays. Tell me about what that's for. That is food for a cereal aphid, which we raise here which is in turn food for a beneficial wasp, a parasitic wasp, about the size of a fruit fly, harmless to plants, harmless to people, and that lives in the, in the area here by the greenhouse, and that will kill any aphids that happen to fly in here from outside. 
So it's funny that you actually bring in a food source to attract aphids, but you want the aphids there to keep the wasp around to take out all the other aphids on your primary crop, right? Correct. There has to be some food source here for the beneficials at all times. So in the event that there are no pest aphids in the area, we need to provide some food for these beneficials to stay around. Rich, how long have you been using biological controls here at the nursery? This is our fourth year. And tell me about the experience from before to now. Well, being a grower, I used to have the, the sea bug, spray bug mentality. We're coming out to the crop, I see a bug, I didn't care whether it was good or bad, I wanted to get rid of it. We're growing plants, not bugs. Yeah. Now we're more proactive. Before the pest bugs come in, we're releasing the beneficials and that keeps the pest bugs from getting to a population where they harm the plants. So what sort of results have you seen having looked at this for four years? Uh, the plants, because they're not getting chemical sprays on them, are much more natural. The colors are much brighter. The, uh, we have a retention pond in the back of the greenhouse. All the excess water goes into the retention pond. Used to be a lot of chemicals went to that retention pond. Now, there's, that pond is full of life, animal plant life, because there's no more chemicals going in there. So do you ever see yourself going back to a conventional spray program then? Absolutely not. Suzanne, talk about the advantages to the homeowner of buying plants that are basically managed with biological controls. One of the first advantages is you're actually supporting a company that's making a difference in the environment. Um, so by supporting them, you're supporting clean air and clean land and clean water. Uh, second of all, when you handle plants, you don't have to worry about any pesticide residues on them, especially if you're going to be gardening with your children. And then also, since the plants were grown with biocontrol agents, when you take them home, the biocontrol agents come with them and will keep working for you in your garden. That's a very nice feature. What about uh, you when you show up at a place like this? What are you looking for? Walk me through the process. Uh, the first thing we do is we walk the entire area to see what is here. We'll look for areas like the forest behind us. That actually can be a place where there could be naturally occurring beneficials already, and so we can work to draw them in. Then then we'll go around and look for sanitation issues to see if things are clean under the benches. Mm -hmm. And then we actually will go through their regular pesticide spray program and look to see if we can take out any sprays by making their spray program smarter. Then we'll slowly integrate biocontrol agents in and then eventually hopefully move to a biocontrol agent program where they're using 100% biocontrol to control their pest problems. Nice process. I just love freshly harvested corn, guys. It is the epitome for summer for me, and the sweetness is out of control. And with this fresh corn, I'm gonna be making a homemade succotash. Really fast, extremely tasty. Here we go. After I've shucked them, this is a little secret that I learned in the industry, being a chef. If you have a large bowl, what that does is it uh, saves the end of your knife as you cut down, but if you have it lined with a big towel like this, it makes transferring it that much easier. So I'll just cut the little kernels right off this cob. Here we go. And there we go. These go into the composter. Joe loves that. And off to the side. And a few more things that are in this dish. They all come out together at the same time of the year. Tomatoes, onions, bell pepper. That's why Mother Nature, she's genius. All these things work perfectly together. And I'll slice up some of these tomatoes. All right, and that is the last one. And this goes off to the side. A little bit of red onion, a quick dice, and we're gonna start. All right, now we're ready to get started. How about a medium to medium high flame? Now while that's heating up, a little bit of garlic, yellow bell pepper, and we're, believe it or not, halfway done. Nice hot pan, extra virgin olive oil, and we'll start out with that great sizzle of these beautiful red onions. And that is the sound that I love. The last thing to cut up is beautiful yellow bell pepper. Red, orange, all those colors are work for this dish.
Now we'll throw in these beautiful bell peppers. How about a little bit of heat? Fantastic. Dried chili flakes. Now's the time to add that, along with the garlic. Who doesn't like garlic? And also, a little bit of fresh thyme never hurt anybody. It brings a nice flavor, a nice summer flavor to this. Almost a lemony flavor. We'll just pick this apart just like that. One more toss, and in goes the star of all of this, that fresh summer corn. And this is what I'm talking about, guys. So easy. And that's your cleanup, done. And now's the time for these fresh summer tomatoes. There we are. Just the smell of that is amazing. But you also want to season as you go. Fresh kosher salt. Kosher. All right. If it looks a little dry, it's okay to add a little more olive oil because olive oil makes everything better. And in this pot over here, Black-eyed peas, guys. Freshly shucked black-eyed peas. Just cook them until they're nice and soft. All right, and in they go. Woo! And we're just about done. Oh, it's getting heavy. Now, all these flavors need just one more thing to make them pop, and that's where this comes into play. This is white wine vinegar. Flavors are amazing, and it just brings it up to the next level, makes it really vibrant. One quick toss. And these are cooked. Turn that off, but I want just a little bit more color in there. And that's where these come into play, these fresh herbs. We have basil, and we also have parsley. A quick chop on these, and then it's time to plate. Mm. Parmesan, ready to go. Just a little bit this beautiful succotash. Look at those colors. The tomatoes are starting to wilt. That fresh corn looks amazing right on the top. This chiffonade of fresh basil like that. I'm gonna hand pick some of this fresh parsley. And just a touch of this Parmigiano Reggiano right on top. Just like butter. And there we are. A fresh corn succotash your family is going to love. When it comes to keeping your own little corner of the world lighter on pest without using chemicals, it really is incredible to see all the ways Mother Nature has devised. All she asks of us is a little faith and patience. Well, after today, we hope you have some new tools in your arsenal for more eco-friendly pest control. Suzanne is a wealth of information, so we've assembled some of her best articles to get you started on natural pest control. And you can also watch all of our videos and Chef Nathan's cooking recipes, too. Simply visit our website. And the address is the same as our name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. I'm Joe Lample. And I'm Patty Moreno. And we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World. And these are all organic and pest-free. Aren't they awesome? Beautiful. Yeah, I love them. All these vegetables, Mother Nature puts them out there. <laughs> Where am I getting this accent from? It's amazing. I, I know you did. Puts, puts them all around. Wait, 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 wait.